the gap between the pickup and the reluctor on magnetic pulse generators in a distributor is adjustable on some vehicles and is critical for proper ignition operation. True. That's ignition system test four. Can you, where, can you think of one that is adjustable? Uh, you're talking about a crank sensor, right? Well, the, uh, in the distributor is what it says here. Oh, in the... Uh, can you adjust the distributor in the past time? You can on some vehicles. The only reason that you're able to move the distributor and change the timing is if it's getting its signal out of that reluctor. Now, like on a, uh, a Jeep Cherokee with a distributor, if you turn the distributor, you're not going to set the timing. Because it's got a crank sensor. Crank sensor. What's in the distributor is a cam sensor. And one time years ago, Philip Kirkland, uh, this guy that I worked with, a real good friend of mine, uh, he was really sort of not... He was good on other vehicles, but he hadn't ever worked on Jeeps a whole lot. And he was uh, had gas in the cylinders on this Jeep because the fuel pressure regulator had you know ruptured it, and it was trying to hydraulic lock on the gas. So he's gonna pull the spark plug out, spin it over, and blow the gas out of the cylinder. I mean, that's, that's pretty much how you do that. That's about the only way to do it. So to kill the ignition system, he unplugged the wire from a distributor. But that didn't kill the ignition system because it's got a crank sensor back there bleeding mm -hmm. off the flywheel. So when he spun it over, uh, he had two things happen. He had gas going everywhere, and he had sparks popping. <laughs> and it looked like an anti-aircraft gun out in the parking lot, blowing big balls of flaming gasoline up into the sky at an angle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was fun. All right, number that was true though. Basically, the Chrysler uh, electronic ignition distributors have got an adjustable. Uh, there's, you're supposed to use a brass feeler gauge to set them. I think ten thousandth of an inch between hey, it's them. Regular gauge. Huh? It's a regular gauge. Yeah. And uh, so that's the true. Uh, the first one's true. Just remember the first one's true. The upward line of the ignition oscilloscope trace for a single cylinder is called the spark line. Is it? What are we talking about, the upward line? Mm -hmm. Come on, guys. Don't play dumb with me. All right. Okay. You're coming along. You got this. You got this. You got that. Remember that? Remember that story? Yeah. Remember how to do that? Let's draw it a little lower on the board. All right, we're going to draw it up. It pops up. It comes down. you got a table. you got these wiggles. This is the, the part going up. It's the firing line. It's not It's called the firing line. This is the spark line. The reason the spark goes out, you're going to, oh, I might have to go out and draw this right. You're going to have an up kick right here. And the reason you got an up kick, remember I told you the other day, is because it, it runs out of gas. Runs out of gas, the resistance increases as it runs out of gas. It's out a little bit. Huh? It basically leans out, right? Yeah, it just burns out. It, I mean, the spark just goes away because it can't. there's not any more molecules of gas to carry the spark. And so it, whenever it does that, it's like snapping a rubber band and the leftover energy is here. You're supposed to have these squiggles. You're supposed to have that up kick. You're supposed to have a nice clean, clean firing line, which I didn't quite draw right. It all looked like that. Now, sometimes you'll see a firing line on a scope that looks like this. <laughs> you know, usually it'd be a bad spark plug or something like that. But fun. and uh, if you've got a really tall firing line, that basically means that you're uh, you got an open plug wire or something like that. If you've got a real short firing line, and I'm talking about this, this vertical line, mm -hmm. that means you got a foul spark plug or something like that. See you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All right. Now then, if you don't have any reserve energy squiggles, it means you got a weak ignition coil, or you got weak juice feeding your, you know, like if I take a test light and go into the track tack side of the coil while I'm watching the scope pattern, that test light drinks up enough of that call current to where you're going to see these squiggles go away, and you're just going to see a, something that looks like this. I see that. You know, a million times. Okay. All right, so that's a little oscilloscope thing here. First time I ever saw an oscilloscope was in 1983 when I was at the Volkswagen place, and there was a scope that was suspended from the ceiling that you could move to any stall. It was really cool. Big old scope, sun scope. And I, I learned how to use that thing. I hook it up. And one day I had one that was running bad. And what the firing line would look like, and this is cool right here. You know, whenever it was idling, whenever it was idling you had a fairly normal spark line. But whenever it would, when I'd rev it up, and it would be missing and cutting out, this was all over the place. This, this firing line would spike up even higher than, I'm talking about the spark line, which is a, the table here, yeah. would, spark, would spike up even higher than the firing line. What do you think was wrong with it? No, it had a stopped up fuel filter. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
I mean, because it was just having a, we had serious, you know, issues with, it was taking a heck of a lot of juice to fire that, to keep that spark there, because there wasn't any gas in the cylinder. Yeah. Number three, running a spark plug wire slightly away from a ground on modern vehicles uh, called open circuiting can cause serious damage to the, uh, well, this is really a poorly worded question. Um, if you take the spark plug wire and you pull it loose from the plug, right? That's an open circuit, pretty much. If you pull it loose enough to work with firing, then all of that energy is trying to scream back into the ignition coil. You know what I mean? All right, so that's, and, it's, and it can destroy your ignition coil and other parts like that. It's really not a good idea to do that, but uh, what, that's why one of the things that I like to teach when we're doing a power balance test and we're filling the cylinders one at a time, if you can't get to the injector so that you can unplug them to kill the cylinders, the best way to kill the cylinder if it's got spark plug wires is to hook a test light to ground and work at the test light between the boot and the wire down there and short out. You know, you're not puncturing anything, you're just going between the boot and the wire. And that's the best way to do that because that way you're not endangering the module. You're not endangering yourself because it's going to go to ground through that test light bulb. It ain't going to light the test light bulb. It's just going to kill the cylinder. You got that? That's how you're supposed to do that. That's how I decided to do it. Now, they have on the, uh, the uh, sun scope, the sun oscilloscope people. The, I used another sun machine over there. And they had a special lead that you would ground, and it had a little, it was for the model a test light with no bulb. And you were, it was made to do that with. See, so you could kill the ignition on that. All right, number four. Uh, but anyway, that's three, number three is true. Number four, uh, the voltage required to fire the spark plugs decreases when the engine is under load due to higher compression in the combustion chamber. Wrong. That's just as backwards as it can be. It goes the other way. Uh, it's going to require more. And I'll tell you something else you can do. If you know that every, I mean, that you've got, like all the ones that had carburetors on them, you know, you typically had plenty of fuel for at least a snap acceleration, even if, you know, the reservoir is carburetor full. And if you pop that gas pedal on the floor real quick, and it's going boom, 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 going up, your, plug, your plugs are breaking down. Or you have a weak spark. You know what I'm saying? Now, what I would do is I would hook my uh, test light, like we, like I showed the other day. I've got a YouTube video I put on there that really got a lot of hits. This poor man's scope thing. If you hook your test light to the tag side of the coil, you're going to see it pulsing, right? Mm -hmm. If you pull a plug, plug wire off, then it, the pulse gets, you know, brighter. And it's, it's like an open plug wire. It ought to have an even little pulse for each, you know, each time that coil fires. If one of them is flashing brighter than the other pulses, and I can show you that in the Bronco really easily, then that's a poor man's scope. It, one flashes uh, brighter than that one. Well, yeah, you can demonstrate what I'm talking about by hooking it to the tack side of the coil and watch it flicker. And then you're going to pull that uh, wire, and it's going to, if it pulses brighter, that's what it'll look like when you got an open plug wire. And when I got one in there for a tune-up or anything, any kind of running problem, the first thing I would do is uh, on these... You know, with a distributor, and I mean, pump it like a Bronco we got out here. I would go to the tack side of the coil, and I'd see if I had anything flashing real bright. Right? Mm. All right. And if I didn't, but it was a misfire problem, I'd spray the spark plug wires with 409 or soapy water or something like that. Right down there by the facility. And if you see when I'm starting going pop, 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 that particular one, and if it starts skipping, that spark plug wire is bad. See, now this pulsing thing won't show up a spark plug wire that's leaking spark. It'll just show up when it's open on the end of the burn. Into. If you pull the plug wire off and look down in it and it looks all sooty and smutty down in there, then that plug wire is bad. If you look down in there and it looks nice and clean, then, you know, on both ends, you got to untook it in the distributor too. And, uh, but I mean, I did everything. And something else I'd do is when I hook that test light up on the ones, on these vehicles I was familiar with, if you hook the test light up and you snap accelerate it, if it stumbles and falls on its face that way, it needs plugs. Or it's got a weak coil or something like that. But typically it'll be spark plugs. So if you got good, if you got healthy spark plugs, and you hook that test light up and you snap accelerate it, it'll go even with a test light on it. Now you can't drive it like that, but just snap accelerate. See, a snap accelerate tells you a heck of a lot. And whenever you're uh, looking at a scope, uh, when you snap accelerate it, the parts are, they're going to go up. But you can basically tell by looking at this. When you usually look at a scope, you can tell if you got bad plugs or something like that. But number six. Uh, an EI ignition system is one that uses it. Excuse me, number five. Uh, coil saturation must increase at higher vehicle speeds to allow more time for spark to develop. This is accomplished by lengthening the dwell time. Now, what is the dwell time? Anybody know? 
All right, you remember how points work. The points are closed, and while the points are closed, the coil is saturating. Right? You got that, Sean? Yes, sir. The coil is saturating. Mm -hmm. You're saturating the coil. Okay. When the points open and the that saturation collapses, that's where your spark comes from. Okay. The longer you keep your points closed, the more coil saturation time you have. Now, some of you guys that are hot rod, you know, savvy, might even remember that some of the hot rod distributors would have two sets of points in it. I had a Mustang four points in it. Yeah, more points, two points in it. And the reason that they got more than one set of points is because you cannot increase the dwell time with a single set of points as much as you can with two sets of points. See what I mean? So you want to saturate your coil longer so you have more spark, I mean stronger spark. And so basically five is true, increasing the dwell time. Now, the reason they talk about dwell, the reason they talk about dwell is your distributor is turning 360 degrees, right? Mm -hmm. The amount of, the number of degrees of distributor rotation that the points are closed is your dwell. Uh, okay. And on your V8, and they even got a dwell meter that you can hook up and put it on 4.6, right? And it'll read the dwell with a needle or, you know, if it's digital, whatever. And uh, we used to use those dwell meters for other things too. Like I could hook them up to a torque converter clutch and tell if you know what the percentage. You know, there's all kinds of cool stuff you can do with a dwell meter. But they originally were designed to use, and I had one in my toolbox for years and years and years. I don't know where it is now. Uh, but anyway, uh, that darn thing, uh, thirty about thirty degrees is usually what a V8 the dwell would be on. It would vary just a little bit between a Ford and a Chevrolet and a Dodge and all that. You could also set the points with a with a you know, feeler gauge, 17 thousandths of an inch or something like that. So, all right, so now let's look at number six. An EI ignition system is one that uses the distributor to correctly deliver the spark to the appropriate cylinder. And you got no distributor if it's an EI, right? Number seven, the maximum available voltage in the ignition coil must always be less than the required firing voltage for an engine to perform well. <laughs> it needs to be more, not less, okay? Number eight, primary ignition coil windings will always have fewer turns and be made of finer wire than the secondary ignition coil windings. Okay, you remember your primary ones are the ones that you're, your primary ones are the ones, the little ones. Like you got a, let's just go with an old wall filled coil, right? You got a tower in the middle, and you got a little wire, and you got a little wire, right? Okay, the winding that's connected between these two is actually going to be your uh, primary. See, primary is always the trigger. And the workhorse, this one here is going to have about, let's say this one, and we're going to do, do math here. This one here, let's say it's got 100 windings. And this one here, the secondary will have a million. So what you do is you're trading the current that you got here for voltage by, by a factor of however many, you know, like if you got 100 windings here and 1,000 windings there, you're multiplying it times 10. See, how, that's how that works. I mean, basically the, the primary windings, however many, more you've got. And if you ever go into an ignition coil, if you ever break into one, those oil fill coils, if you ever grind one of them open, don't get that oil in your bloodstream because it's really filthy poison, you know, deadly poison. What is it? It's just some coil, uh, transformer oil, basically is what it is. But you, uh, if you can get it out of there and, you know, wash that off real good so it's safe and all that, wearing your gloves and your safety glasses and all that, and you can get the inside out of that coil, that copper wire in a secondary winding is littler than any thread you've ever seen. And I used to take a piece of it, a little piece of it, and I would string it across the door in the house because I'd have to get my dad, you know, I'd grind coals up and get this stuff out. String it across. Nobody could see it because you're looking past it. When you walk through it, pew, you know, doesn't hurt anything, but it makes you wonder who threw something at you. <laughs> you know, but things right here that explode. Yeah. Because I threw one in the smelter one day at work. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, it's pressure. It's, pressure. it's like throwing a can of beans in there. You know, that's what you'll do. Boom. Yeah, eight. I blew the back door of it open. Yeah. <laughs> Number eight, the primary ignition coil winding will always have fewer turns to be made of a finer wire. The secondary ones will have more turns. And be, and see, the, fewer, the primary ones have a thicker wire than the, the secondary ones. Basically, they ask they got two things you got to parse there. Number nine, uh, spark plug wires are not solid wires, but carbon impregnated fibers that act as resistors in the secondary circuit. Years ago, years and years ago, Delco Remy used to make spark plug wire that had wire in it. And you could buy it on a roll. And I bought a roll of it from the parts house. And I found out why they use these carbon fiber wires 
when this guy brought his 66 Chevy pickup up there to my dad's shop, and I built some plug wires. I kind of enjoyed doing that. You know, just build some plug wires, tailor them the right length and all that kind of stuff. Crimp the little ends on them, and they were just, you couldn't tell they weren't factory wires when I got through. We could buy the boots. I mean, everything was cool. But when my dad had a radio in his shop and was playing country music or something like that, and when I fired up that truck, you couldn't even hear that radio. It's horrible, horrible radio interference. And I found out later that the Federal Communications Commission can impound your vehicle if you have got something like that on it that's making that bad radio interference. Because it, it's, yeah, it's breaking the law. It's, and so all of these, We're all of this. Around the stop, huh? Around the stop, well, yeah, but basically the smart thing to do is get carbon fiber wire because you don't have to wrap again pull around those. But I mean, anything. It, and what it amounts to is all between those wires, there's little sparks jumping up in and down. So they got those several strands of wire. And there's sparks jumping in between there, and everywhere you got a naked spark, you got radio frequency interference. Got it? Everywhere there's a naked spark, it's going to create radio signals. Okay. Now you know the, the spark plug, the dielectric grease that we put on the spark plug wires. Remember, you know why that's there? You know, you got a spark plug wire. The top of it is shaped kind of like that right there. Now a lot of the times, whenever I start talking about this kind of stuff, it, it challenges what people have been taught to believe all their lives. And so I get, you know, people will squawk about it. And they'll tell me, no, there's nothing to that. It's not wash. Okay, when I snap that spark plug wire on there, it's got a little band that pops into there, you know, on both one side or both sides or whatever. And so that's basically you thinking that's touching. That's the only, that's where it'll be okay. But what you're going to have is this is not really a perfect fit, and you're going to have a lot of little renegade sparks jumping around in here. But when you put the dielectric grease on there, it basically coats this so that the only place the spark, the dielectric grease does not conduct electricity at all. It coats this where it, no spark can jump anywhere except where the metal is actually touching. And that keeps you from having RFI. That's one of the reasons you're supposed to put tune-up grease on spark plug wire. Now, you might not ever have a problem with that. One day, Katie, this girl that I knew that worked at Docs, who was a waitress, uh, she came over and said, my radio is making a noise on my engine running. You know, and you switch off the engine, turn the radio, and do that. And it didn't do it with tapes. They only do it with radio. Work. And uh, you know, inside the distributor, you got this little, right in the center of it, you got a little carbon button. And the rotor rides against, you know, it's got this little tab that rides against there. And then it goes out here and it sorts out the spark when it's spinning around. This little carbon button came out of here. And it was rolling around down in this little pocket right down here. And so every time that her spark jumped, and she had a naked lightning bolt right there. And that's where her radio frequency interference was coming from. So when you pull the distributor cap off, if you see that little carbon button rolling around down in there, you're going to have RFI. Uh, we put another distributor cap on it, and she's good to go. Okay, now then, number 10, computer-controlled ignition systems. Oh, by the way, number 9 was true. Uh, Computer-controlled ignition systems offer continuously variable spark timing control through a network of engine sensors and a central microprocessor. And that is true. Spark control is done dynamically by computers, and it has been for a very long time. Um, number 13. Why don't I jump over one? Excuse me. Wait a minute. I got over. I got over twelve. No, Eleven. Excuse me. A customer complaint of power loss condition be, can be due to what? C. That's going to be C. Both A and B. Ignition oscilloscope screen showing all the cylinder traces, one on top of the other, is superimposed. That's not rocket science, is it? Superimposed. Now, what they call it when you're when you're looking at a scope pattern and it's like this, where they're lined up, and you're looking at all like that, that's called a parade. Okay. Now, whenever they all are right on top of one another, I mean, in other words, it looks like you're just looking at one, but you've actually got them all stacked like this, that's superimposed. If you've got them laid across the screen like this, with a final line like that, that's called raster, okay? So those are the three types of patterns you have, okay? Okay, 13 now. B, one of the most, and that is B, the, the right answer is B to 13. One of the most common ways to check for spark installation breakdown is to spray water from a spray bottle on the installation. Now, if you don't want to do that, you need to have, spray some water with some soap in it. 
that will break the surface tension. You know, the surface tension of water, sometimes it'll just beat up and run off. But if you put a little bit of a little bit of soap in it, something like that, even a little bit of salt works better. Just make slightly salt water, and you spray it on there, it, it, it will uh, cause a spark to start popping. Now, don't get confused if it's late in the evening and it's kind of dark under the hood or whatever, and you spray, you may see a little bit of orange spark activity, but if the engine doesn't start misfiring or you don't see lightning, you know, you usually see lightning and it'll start misfiring. Sometimes you'll just see little orange, weak little orange sparks. Looks like a little light show. That, that don't mean nothing. You know, you can't always go by that. All right. Uh, number 14, the electrical sensor that provides the powertrain control module with information to identify the piston approaching top dead center on compression is what? That's the camshaft sensor. The camshaft sensor? Mm hmm. I do not really like that question, and I don't like that answer, because basically what the camshaft sensor does is it sends its signal 24 degrees after top dead center, typically. Now, that's typically what it is. It's going to vary from vehicle to vehicle. But on a Chevrolet and on a Ford, 24 degrees after top dead center, all the fire has gone out. Got it? 24 degrees after top dead center, all your fire has burned out. And so that's when it's okay to spray the next charge of fuel. The camshaft position sensor is typically in place on the ones I'm familiar with to, for the purpose of uh, giving it information about when to use the fuel injectors. That's usually what that's for. But now, on some of them, when you unplug the cam sensor, it won't start. On some of them, when you unplug the cam sensor, it will start. Some of them, like on that Taurus out there, that Sable that you rebuilt the motor on, you can unplug the cam sensor and drive it indefinitely. But it'll just give you a PO340 code. On a Nissan, Altima, you unplug the cam sensor, it may start and it may not. I mean, that's, that, and they're critical. I mean, those things are absolutely critical. The timing of those two sensors, uh, on a Mitsubishi, like some of these Mitsubishi cars that you see, uh, the ones that I've seen of those, when you unplug the cam sensor, dead in the water. You ain't going nowhere. See, so they also use the cam sensor to, do, to, to check misfires. So that they can tell that you know they use a crank and a cam sensor together for perfect positioning, so that they can tell uh, you know if they, it knows exactly which cylinder slowed down. You see what I'm saying? After it, has, it learns. Okay, number fifteen. Superior coil saturation time is found on uh, coil on plug ignition time. Why is this? A. A coil only needs to fire once per two engine revolutions. B. No spark plug wire exists. C, dwell on these coils cannot be controlled, or D, platinum spark plugs allow the coil to build up a stronger magnetic field. That's actually A, uh, but I'm going to say that on our Crown Victorias and stuff, the coil fires three times every time it fires at idle. It's got multiple parts of the radio 94 Escort over there. If you put a scope on it, you're going to see three firing lines every time it pops at idle. If you crack it above idle, it's going to be popping once. But the long and the short of it is, if one of those things gets a hold of you, it will light you up. Very bad. Big time. Hold on. Spark plug wire. Check and see if it's firing off our street stop one time. It'll be me. Yeah. Yeah, it'll take, it'll, 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 it'll be. Now, if you don't want to, I said this before, if you don't want to get bit, um, what you can do is you can take a, like a wrist strap like the computer people use and put it on, put it on like this, or you can hook this to your, Hook a jumper wire to your spark plug. The pliers, you know, the, the special pliers you pull plug wires off with, if you ground them with a jumper wire, you'll never get bit because it'll always go through the jumper wire. Or if you can manage to, you can take a, take a strap and put it around your wrist like a computer people use where you're grounding your wrist strap to the, it keeps static away. Uh, you can handle them plug wires all you want to, and they might jump out and get you, but all they'll get your hand. And it ain't really hurt anything if it comes into your hand and goes there. And I used to lay my hand on the, uh, I'd lay my hand on something metal when I was working with the ignition coil. And Philip Kirkland, he's another guy that I mentioned a lot because I worked with him a lot. He was just absolutely could not abide getting shocked by the plug wire. I mean, it just gave him the heebie jeebies. And I laid my hand on that and I was pulling that plug wire off because I had my hand laying on this metal. Whenever it jumped out and hit my thumb, it didn't do anything except just bap and I went mm, you know <laughs> I knew it coming it didn't really but it's not like it's running across here mm -hmm. see what I'm saying because it runs up your arm you know doing all that stuff but I mean I basically would just let it jump in my thumb and he saw that happen and I thought he was going to throw up 
because he watched it happen. He was walking like, ooh. Yeah. He, he was peculiar anyway. He'd pick up biting bugs and hold them in his hand, but you could take a cockroach and chase him all the way to Cottonwood. What? I mean, he was scared to death of roaches, but he, I mean, any bug it would bite, he'd pick them up and hold them in his hand. All right, number 16. A metal tag visible through the driver's side windshield provides the technician with a variety of information, mm-hmm. and it's called the VIN. Right. Okay, number 17. Blank is the most common in two parallel spark plug wires which fire one after the other in fire. Oh, this is fun. This is good stuff. Y'all bear with me, okay? Everybody bear with me? Okay, let's look it up. Okay, that's eight spark plug wires, right? Okay, now on a Ford, you're turning this way, right? And on a Chevy, you're turning the other way, am I right? But anyway, so you got one, eight, four, three, six, five, seven, two. That's a Chevy. All right, now where's five and seven on the engine? Hello? Somebody tell me. Where's number one? Right there. One's right here. Three, five, seven. Look at here. Five and seven is next to each other on the distributor, and they're also next to each other on the engine. All right, when you run those two wires right next to one another, all the way down, and you say, I'm going to be a good mechanic. I'm going to run these wires so they're real straight in this loom, and they look real pretty going over there. And then all of a sudden, you've got induction crossfire. That's the answer to that question. Because... This part fired right before that one did. And all the way down that by that wire, it has created a spark in that other wire because it's induced it. And what happens is, where is this, where is this cylinder here? When this one fires, where is that one? Look at the firing order, guys. When this oh. one when this one's when this one's firing, where is that one? Coming up. It's on its way up. Okay, because of the fact that it's coming up. The fire that was induced in this wire going to that one is now firing it early. Oh. And it labor knocks on that one cylinder, and you pull the spark plug out, and it's destroyed. Because you got some heavy duty explosions going. Yeah, you got your air fuel mix, you're squeezing it, but you ain't ready to pop yet. Got it? Yeah. Now, how do you fix that? Move it away. He's muttering. What? Here's what you're going to do. Watch this. I'm going to take that one, and I'm going to run the ones to three, and I'm going to run the one to one, and I'm going to make sure that they're between five and seven. Make doggone sure you got two wires. It doesn't matter if you induce it in the one that's already fired or is way under gone, but if they're right next to one another. Now, it's the same way on a Ford. On a Ford, you've got one five. I actually numbered these backwards for a Chevrolet. I numbered the Chevrolet the counterclockwise. But the point I'm trying to make is, you know, one five, four, two, six, three, seven, and eight. Got it? Seven and eight are in that same spot. And they're right next to each other on a firing order. See how that can happen? That's why they're talking about this. Inductive crossfire. If you ever run into this, you'll never forget it. But if you've got a strange sounding miss that's coming with a labor knock, you need to make sure that those two cylinders aren't right next to one another in fire order. Now, that's only valid when spark plug wires are running to them. You won't ever see that, as far as I know, on one that's got some other kind of ignition. You know, I mean, like if it's got coil on plug, that's what I meant. So number 17 is induction crossfire, or crossfire induction, if you want to say it that way. Number 18, high-voltage electricity can take an unwanted path through a distributor cap or rotor across an ignition soil and leave behind a fine powdery line. And that's called what? What is that called? It's called a carbon track. I'm going to tell you something else. Right here is a carbon track. And inside that spark plug boot, this right here is actually a carbon track on that spark plug. This boot was the one that was on that spark plug when that carbon track was made. Now, you'll usually see these. You'll usually only see this on coil-on plug ignition. And not coil-on plug, I'm sorry, uh, coil pack ignition. Now, what happens is 
these spark plug, if you look at this spark plug, it is worn completely out. I mean, there's nothing left of that sucker. And as the resistance goes up and up and up and up and up, it starts to cause the spark to look for somewhere else to go. And when the spark finds somewhere else to go, it's actually jumping down the outside of the plug hitting this because it's easier to do that than it is to fire this wore out, used up, crappy spark plug. All right, so this is what happens then. That carbon track is there, but there's also a matching carbon track in this boot. All right? You can see it if you look good enough. You can look in there and you can turn that thing around and you can see it. Listen, here's this spark plug wire has been on and off here so many times it's just about wiped out. No, it's still there. You can see it. There's one that matches that perfectly inside that boot. I saved this for that reason. Now, you can look at those and see that carbon track. If you don't replace that boot or that wire that had that track, then you're going to have a comeback because it will it will make a brand new one even though you got a good spark plug. It wants to follow that carbon track really bad. So if you see that, replace the plugs and replace that one, you know, whichever ones. The plugs and all the wires is okay, but at the very least you need to replace that one. That's what the deal is. So I will pass this around. Here, look at that. And try to look if you can and see that. You can see that carbon track on the inside of that boot because you can't wipe that out of there. It's going to be there. It's poignant. Number 19. All right. Now, that incident is called carbon track. Number 19. They used to have it inside distributor caps all the time. Uh, did you ever hear anybody say that you can mark around on the inside of a distributor cap with a pencil and the car won't run? And what? I heard that for a long time because that graphite carries a juice like a carbon track. Oh. I tried that here back when I was going to plant a bug. I took a distributor cap off a car we had and I just colored it all inside with a pencil. That thing ran just so good. I don't, you know, I don't know. I couldn't even verify that. Okay, now number 19, uh, a machine that can perform multiple diagnostic tests like cylinder ignition performance, battery charging, and starting system checks, and emission level analysis. Blah. That's called an engine analyzer. Come on. Number 20, blank is a measurement of the amount of air fuel mixture that actually enters the combustion chamber compared to the amount that could be ingested at that speed. We talked about this yesterday. What do you call that? Hmm? Volumetric efficiency. Remember that word, Sean? Volumetric efficiency. All right, let me ask you this. If I spin an engine over less, less how much is your compression uh, on your race car? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, that ain't very much. Usually, usually it'll be really high. Like like on a, a regular Ford Taurus like mine is usually about 160 PSI. Yeah, how much is it? How much is it running? What? Running. 60 pounds, something like that. Yeah, the reason is if you check running compression is lower unless you got it supercharged. Now, one of these days, I want to take you guys collectively out to Billy Pilcher's shop and let you see what he does out there. It's awesome. It is really awesome out there. I was there yesterday. I took my head over there. All right. And there's some, of these, some of these engines he's building, you just want to walk around and look at them for a while. <laughs> I mean, he builds, like he's yeah, he starts from scratch and gets big blocks of aluminum, I think, and he cuts them all out and makes engines from nothing. Huh? Oh, that was an engine analyzer. Volumetric efficiency is the next one. Okay, now we got number 21. An engine design that uses a spark plug in a pre-combustion chamber with a rich mixture in a leaner mix main combustion chamber. Why do you need to know this stuff? That's called a stratified charge, okay? Number 22, a margin of voltage that can be produced above that which is required to fire the spark plug represents the what? Reserve voltage, okay? That's what I was talking about that gives you your squiggle after the, uh, at the end of that scope pattern. Um, number 23, the margin of voltage which can be produced above that, uh, excuse me, I already said that, wait a minute, 23, not 22, when a spark arrives too late or after the time is supposed to occur, the time is what? Retarded ignition time. All right, now let me ask you this, what is what is ignition time and this retarded feel like when you're driving the car? Huh? It's sluggish. It feels like it won't hardly pull your hat off, you know? All right, what about if it's too far advanced? What kind of symptoms do you get then? <laughs> Please. No, actually what it does is it causes it to either, it'll start hard, kick back when it's trying to start. That's one thing it'll do. Uh, it may not do that. Another thing it'll do is it'll ping and labor knock. And it can buck and jump. 
one down the road. And uh, okay, so just get, keep that in mind because nowadays we don't set the timing very much on our cars. But an escort, like the one you drive, it's got that wheel on the front of it. It's reading off that variable rotor sensor. If somebody puts a timing belt on it and they don't tighten that bolt good, it will waller that keyway out and that balancer will start moving back and forth. And so you'll take off on the car and the balancer will move one way. And because it's the that's the primary uh, signal for the, it can retard the ignition timing. You know, so you'll drive off and it won't hardly pull. And then you, you know, jack the engine around and that causes the pulley to move. And now all of a sudden you got good power. And then the next thing you know, you ain't got good power. It's coming and going. And so you pull the pull this pulley off because those don't those don't press on there. They basically can just take a bolt out and pull them off. Well, somebody put a time belt on their backyard. They just tied it with a wrench, figured it'd be eight. Uh uh-uh. uh. And what happens is you look at it, and now you've wallered the dead gum keyway in the crankshaft and the doggone uh, pulley, and it destroys the crankshaft. Yeah, I mean a lot of times you got to put a crankshaft unless you can put it right where it is and you want to weld it. And who wants to do that, you know? All right. Now then. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you could do it if it was a junk cart. You wasn't going to do anything except haul hay on or something like that, you know? All right. So number 24. A blank produces an accurate digital voltage signal produced through the entire RPM range of the engine, especially at low engine speed, which is more compatible with signals required by home port computers. <sighs> Hall effect. We told about that lately. We talked about that yesterday. Okay. The systems that use a coil every two spark plugs use the blank method of spark distribution. What is that? That's called waste spark because the spark is firing in the exhaust stroke on one of the cylinders, which doesn't hurt a thing. All right? Now then.